What's happening everybody? It's Sean with Reactions to the Classics and today we got a full album reaction to The Weekends After Hours. This is brought to us courtesy of our patron and longtime friend Alan. Thank you Alan. Always appreciate you and all of the patrons that help this channel go. If you're interested in supporting us in any way, check out the Patreon link below. Okay, let's dive into this, guys. Yes, I'm the old guy in the room. I really, I, I know a couple of the weekend songs. I don't listen to modern radio, really, with this channel. I only listen to basically the stuff that we're working on in the moment every once in a while, a little something extra. So I don't really know any of this. I know it's an iconic album. I know all the hits. I did all the research on it. There was a lot of research. It took me a while. So uh, we're going to dive into this thing track by track and give it a listen. First off, let's start with some quick facts. It was his fourth studio album released in March of 2020. Thematically, it explores uh, overindulgence, self-loathing, little promiscuous activity. Prior to the album's release, he confirmed that it would face stylistic differences to its predecessor, Starboy, which came out in 2016. Music journalists have noted the album as an artistic reinvention for the weekend with the introduction of new wave and dream pop influences. A lot of 80s influences on here I read, so I'm excited to see how that plays out. Title of the album was inspired by the 1985 movie of the same name by the great Martin Scorsese. In March of 2020, After Hours broke the record for the most global pre-ads in Apple Music history with over 1 million users. The album received generally positive reviews from music critics, with some naming it the weekend's best work. It debuted atop the Billboard Top 200, marking the weekend's fourth number one album in the U.S. Debuted at number one in the U.K. as well, making it his second number one there. Five years after Beauty Behind the Madness went to number one. Also topped the chart of the weekend's, of course, native Canada. 80 out of 100 on Metacritic. Billboard named it number three, best album of 2020. NME named it number 29. And Rolling Stone named it 32 for the year. So before we jump into this, just a reminder, it's your first time joining us as well. The music will not be in the video, but there's a link below. It'll have the entire reaction if you want to hear the songs with me. If you just want to know what I think, just hang around here. As always, I'll have the lyrics up. Thanks again, Alan. Well, there you have it, Alone Again. I mentioned it during the reaction. A lot more chilled than I thought it might have been. It kind of never it picked up a little bit midway through, but not really going all in. A lot of synthesizers already see the 80s influence. It sounded like a drum machine. It could have been real drums. It really did sound like a drone machine, but uh, some obviously some treatment on the weekend's uh, voice there. And, and basically, he's just talking about he doesn't want to be alone again. Um, talks about his substance abuse and overdose scare. Um, you know, speaking out to his lover that uh, he, he wants her to kind of come in and, and rescue him. Um, oh, oh, how much to light up my star again and rewire all my thoughts. Oh, baby, won't you remind me what I am and break, break my little cold heart. I read a lot of this album is, is about his relationship with uh, Bella Hadid, who he dated for a long time. So we're going to get more into that as the songs uh, unfold. A good opener. Really did like the atmosphere. That's going to move us on to Too Late, which... The aforementioned relationship. This lyrics of the song reference the on and off relationship uh, Abel, who's the weekend's real name, has with model Bella Hadid. In the song, he sings about the dysfunctional relationship that he and his partner have, with him apologizing for his mistakes and asking how news outlets know the state of their romance. Isn't that always the question? Let's check it out. Too late. Once again, sonically. You know, I, this is going to be a theme, I'm sure, on this album. Very, very well produced. Everything is very tight. Once again, you got the sense, and it definitely sounds like the drum machine on there again. If, if there is a drummer, I'm sorry. I mean, there might be a drummer on some of these songs. Definitely sounds like the drum machine. Once again, taken 80s sonically. Lyrics are pretty darn good. I let you down. I led you on. I never thought I'd be here without you. Don't let me drown inside your arms. Bad thoughts inside my mind when the darkness comes. You are my light, baby. So once again, holding up this girl, in this case, Bella, I'm assuming, as his almost savior. My light, baby. My light when it's dark. Yeah, I'm too high, baby. Too high, baby. Because I know right now that I lost it. And then the chorus. It's too late to save our souls. It's way too late. We're on our own. I made mistakes. I did you wrong, babe. It's way too late to save my... And then it trails off in the chorus, which is pretty interesting. I like the second verse. It's, it's talking about how does the paparazzi and the press know that we're not doing well. But the next to the last line, we're in hell. It's disguised as a paradise with flashing lights. So a really good track there. Now we're up to track number three, Hardest to Love. 
He wrote and produced a song with producers Max Martin and Oscar Holter. Here's what The Weeknd said about it. This one I did originally with Oscar and then Max finished it with me. I wrote the song very fast. It was the last song on the record that I finished. When I made the song, I was nervous because I felt like I went overboard with the ambition. I'm ambitious, but I thought maybe this is too much. It wasn't until Blinding Lights that I knew I could finish this album and I could put this song on it. And sometimes it just comes down to the melody. That was the fastest melody that I ever made. I went into a room for 20 minutes, wrote the entire song, and then Max produced it. Basically, the lyrics, uh, what I saw is it features him reminiscing on his past behaviors in a relationship, blaming himself for its demise. That's quite the buildup here. Let's check it out. Hardest to love. The one so far of the, of the first three that's most interesting to me vocally, uh, the change-ups. He is going pretty fast at the start. Uh, you try with me so many times. Yeah, you're crying out behind the smiles. And I can see right through the lies. And what we had is dead inside. You're acting like it's still alive and you want to make it right. So... He believes it's over, that he screwed up too much. But then he goes in the chorus, man, and it strips back. And he sounds fantastic. Really no treatment on his vo vocals there. But I've been the hardest to love. You're trying to let me go. And I can see it. I can see it. I've been the hardest to love. It's hard to let me go. And I can feel it. I can feel it. So she's with him, but he can tell she's trying to let him go. She's trying to work through it. Uh, so just really good. The, the bridge is fantastic in there as well. The chorus repeats a few times. He's actually backing himself up on the vocals. And I think that's what gives it that unique sound. And then the instrumental outro I read leads right into our next track, which is Scared to Live. Uh, he wrote and produced the song with the chorus Max Martin and Oscar Holter with Belly, one of Thrick's Point Never, Elton John, and Bernie Taupin receiving additional writing credits as well with the latter two being credited to the track's interpolation of your song by Elton John. Fantastic song. In an interview with Variety, Elton John actually said this, Abel, The Weeknd, has his own unique artistic voice. That's the hallmark of a generally great long-term artist. I'm utterly thrilled that the DNA for your song has found its way into Scared to Live. It's the greatest compliment a songwriter can ever receive. Uh, the lyrics, once again, reference the on and off relationship Abel's had with Bella in this track. He sings to his partner that they shouldn't be afraid to move on from the past and find love again, with him also mentioning that he still yearns for the connection they once had. Let's check this one out. Scared to Live. Once again, very nice lyrically, really good vocal performance as well. When I saw the signs, I should have let you go. So throughout the song, he's basically saying, I held on to you. Instead of letting you go and find yourself and maybe finding yourself back to me to show you that I loved you, basically, I held you tight. And by doing that, I kind of killed the love inside you. I sort of choked it out, so to speak, metaphorically speaking. I, in the pre-course, I know things will never be the same. Time we lost will never be replaced. I'm the reason you forgot to love. So the chorus, so don't be scared to live again. Um, no, don't be scared to live again. You always miss a chance to fall for someone else because your heart only knows me because he held on to her. They tried to win your love, but there was nothing left. They just made you feel lonely. And in the pre-course, I'm not the man I used to be. Did some things I couldn't let you see. Probably his uh, drug abuse. Refused to be the one who taints your heart. Um, and then the, in the post-course, I hope you know that. I hope you know that. I've been praying that you find yourself. I hope you know that. I hope you know that. We fell apart right from the start. That's where the Your Song interpolation, the Elton John, Bernie Toppin stuff comes on. And The Weeknd actually said in an interview about this, he said it's an interpolation. I didn't realize it was until I made it and I was like, oh, yes. So he's credited, obviously, before I played it for him. So he played it like he was there playing it for Elton. I was like, F, I hope he likes it. But he was freaking. He was like, mate, you're the one. You're going to be doing this for a long time. So a great story there. And I really do think he did it justice. Let's move on to the next track. Snow Child. And this one supposedly has him looking back at his past, as he has done on all of these, really addressing his fast come up to fame and past vices like drugs and women that wanted him as he became famous. It refers, the title refers to cocaine slang term snow, further cementing the song's commentary on Abel's well known drug ridden past. Let's check this one out. Snow Child, really a truly autobiographical track. The first one, he's writing all these it seems from personal experience and you know they, they are personal songs but this one starts out when he was 16 talking about how he came up how he actually dropped out of high school and kind of roamed the streets for a little while as he was trying to pursue music full time and he, he just kind of goes through that what he was going through maybe a little bit of self-harm in there maybe it's a metaphor and, you know some cocaine use here obviously um, and, th and then he 
course, leaving, leaving into the night, um, leaving into the night. So I, I guess back in a previous album, one of his first albums, or maybe his first album, he was talking about wanting to go L- uh, to L.A. and become famous. Now he's talking about wanting to return back home. So it kind of all comes full circle. Um, the second verse, he starts dropping stuff about, you know, shady about Eminem, Jay-Z, Patrick Swayze, get me moving dirty like I'm Swayze. Um, just a bunch of different little things there. The bridge, talking about his house in Beverly Hills that he's never been to hardly, never lived in it. Zero Edge Pool, never dipped in it because he's on tour all the time and even even says that going on tour is my vacation. Every month, another accusation. One thing I'm fo- phobic of is failing. I was never blessed with any patience. He's been accused of a lot of uh, copyright infringement, sampling things without uh, without permission. So that is probably what that is a... Uh, a reference to whether he did or didn't, I have no idea because I don't know enough about this, but I think that's probably what he's referencing there. Now we're gonna move to the next to the, the longest track on here. Maybe something similar thematically, I don't know. We're gonna go to Escape from LA. Not not the John Carpenter movie, a reference for my uh, for my peeps that are of my age. Don't have much research wise on this one, so let's just check it out. Escape from LA, a little slower in a lot of the lyricism. Um, you know, basically talking about a relationship as a lot of this is and kind of delving it out and whether it's over or not. I mean, he also had a famous relationship with Selena Gomez. So there's something about Selena in some parts, I think, or Bella in most of these parts. I don't know if he's saying that they're broke up and he's got to get out of LA or the only way they can be together and really, you know, work long term is to get out of this place. Because in the course, well, this place is never what it seems. Take me out. LA, take me out of LA. This place will be the end of me. Take me out, take me out. And then verse two, something about being in his his Porsche, <laughs> speeding like Keanu Reeves, then gives a little uh, you know, a little shout out to the movie Speed. Another little shout out in the next two lines to the movie Constantine, a little Keanu uh, shout out. Because I got everything I wanted, got the money, got the cars, got the ceiling with the stars, got everything I wanted, but I'd be nothing without you. Gave you everything you wanted, gave you power, gave you life, gave you space so you can shine, gave you everything you wanted, but none of that matters to you and goes back into the course and a long, long bridge that's kind of brought out slowly. First, there's a little instrumental in there and then he draws the vocals out very slowly and then goes into the outro, which just really repeats part of the bridge. Enjoy that one as well. There isn't a track on here that I haven't enjoyed. Now we're gonna go up to one of the biggest songs on the album. We got Heartless. It was released as a lead single, reached number one in its second week in the U.S., becoming his fourth number one U.S. single. It references ex-girlfriends at the time, Bella and Selena Gomez. Throughout the first part, he sings about returning to his old playboy lifestyle after breaking up with both of them. In the second half, he starts to sing about his on and off relationship with Bella. This one did win an American Music Award in 2020. His favorite song, Soul slash R and B. Let's check it out. Heartless. I just assumed I had heard that song. This is going to show you where I'm at, boys and girls. I have not ever heard this song. It does start out, just like I said, he's kind of bragging about things. He, he kind of flips the track, Snow Child, where the girl basically doesn't need anyone. They need her. Now he's saying he never needs the girl. He's what the girl needs. So he's he's talking about the drugs and the, and the cars and, and all the women he's been with. Uh, the chorus... Why? Because I'm heartless and I'm back to my ways because I'm heartless. All this money and this pain got me heartless. Low life for life because I'm heartless. Said I'm heartless. Trying to be a better man, but I'm heartless. Never be a wedding plan for the heartless. Low life for life because I'm heartless. So he realizes that all of this, maybe the fame and fortunes brought him down to a lower level where he just doesn't care. It's stolen his identity or maybe is that way, going that way anyway and just accentuated or emphasized it or got it there quicker, but she comes back to him in the bridge. I lost my heart in my mind. I try to always do right. I thought I lost you this time. You just came back in my life. You never gave up on me. And then a little, little uh, call and response. Why don't you? I'll never know what you see. Why won't you? I don't do well when alone. You hear it clear in my tone. And then he finishes out with that heartless uh, chorus. So a good song. Not actually one of my favorites, even though I know it's a huge hit. But a good song. We're at the halfway mark of this album. Let's move on to track number eight. We have Faith. And the lyrics, once again, reference the on and off relationship with Bella. 
Uh, he sings about his struggles with drugs and his inability to well fall in the end of the relationship he had with his partner. He discusses in the song's lyrics he wants no sympathy to be felt for him in his relapse and that he is losing faith in his religion because of his renewed drug usage, with him stating on the track that he'd rather choose Las Vegas hedonism over salvation. He references the hit singles Purple Rain by Prince, Losing My Religion by R.E.M., and Sicko Mode by Travis Scott as well. Looking forward to this one. Let's check it out. Faith, that was a nice one. Nice little technique at the end. It kind of slows all the way down when the outro goes. Everything goes away. There's a nice beat way down I, I see here by Metro Boomin. But everything kind of fades away into just this synthesizer and the, you hear the sirens and stuff because at the end he gets arrested. And a lot of shout outs on these songs to other songs either on previous albums of his or to songs on this album. A lot of shout out to The Blinding Lights, which is going to be our next track, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. He's basically talking about he must have been sober for a while and now he's going to relapse and go back in to that drug use and verse one is all about that uh the course and i feel everything i feel everything from my body to my soul no no why i feel everything when i'm coming down is the most i feel alone you come down those drugs make you feel good but there's always that crash post course I've, I've been sober for a year now now it's time for me to go back to my old ways don't you cry for me thought i'd be a better man so he really did but i lied to me and to you and then getting into that that drug use again. So we talks about the bridge. I lost my faith. I'm losing my religion every day. Time hasn't been kind to me, I pray. When I look inside the mirror and see someone I love, oh, someone I love, faith, I'm re losing my religion every day. So a shout out to the song by, by R.E.M. But of course, that song is really not about losing your religion. Losing your religion is a Southern term about kind of just losing your patience or losing your cool. I think he probably is really talking about losing his religion and his faith. He, he might have prayed maybe that God would take this from him, this desire, but it's still here, so it's making him question a little bit. I don't want to get too much into speaking about what the weekend feels about his faith, but that kind of seems to be the interpretation to it. All right, let's move on to the gigantic hit on this album. Over 2 billion listens on Spotify. This one was the second single, peaked at number one in 34 countries, including the U.S. and Canada, where it became the weekend's fifth number one single in the U.S. It also became its first number one single in Germany for 10 weeks, the U.K. for eight, and Australia for 11. It's his most successful single worldwide today, and I found this very interesting. It holds the record in the U.S. for most weeks spent in the top five Billboard chart, 42 weeks in top 10, 51 weeks Absolutely amazing, almost a year in the top 10. And in a Billboard interview, he expressed his appreciation for the music of the 80s. He said, I've always had an admiration for the era before I was born. You can hear it as far back as my first mixtape that the 80s, Susie and the Banshees and several others play such a huge role in my sound. Sometimes it helps me to create a new sound and sometimes it's just obvious. I'm just glad the world's into it now. Throughout the song, he sings about his rekindling of a relationship and the importance of his partner. He also mentions Las Vegas, which he does in several of these songs, where he refers to it by its nickname, Sin City. It received universal acclaim from critics, named as one of the best songs of 2020 by Billboard and the best song of 2020 by Consequence of Sound. Variety named it as its record of the year. And Elton John, we talked about him earlier, uh, named this as the song of the year and his record of the year. It also became producer Max Martin's 23rd Hot 100 number one single as a writer, 21st as a producer. He has the third most number ones as a writer behind Paul McCartney with 32 and John Lennon with 26, and the second most as a producer behind George Martin who had 23. So shout out to the Beatles still holding down court after 50 years, but Max Martin is gaining on him. And The Weeknd became the first artist to simultaneously lead Billboard's five primary charts on March 30th, 2020. That is quite the accomplishment. I promise you, I do know this song. Well, living up to the hype of being that record holder in the top five and top 10 on the Billboard Hot 100, this song is just your perfect music single, right? The, the way it starts out with the nice kind of throwback 80s synth, and then it just builds in the chorus is, is very anthemic. He sounds fantastic. The tempo changes are spot on, just so, so catchy. You want to sing along with it. I spared you of it, I did, but I didn't sing out loud, but just a really great put together track. 
The blinding lights are most likely the lights of Las Vegas, which he's talking all about. But he feels alone there. He's running out of time. But also the paparazzi. He needs to be with her. Those blinding lights are kind of making him lose himself. So obviously I knew that track. It, it might have been the only track on here that I know as I'm going through here. I thought I might have known a couple of these other ones as I listened to them. But let's move on to the next track, In Your Eyes. Now I know the Peter Gabriel In Your Eyes, but I don't know this In Your Eyes. It went to 16 in the U.S. The weekend said about this one, when you look deeper into the song, it's more complex than it seems. It's basically about two people who are in love with each other who are just effing each other over. The first verse is from one perspective, and the second is from the other perspective. It's like the way people think the police is every breath you take is a love song, and it's not at all. No, it's a stalking song. It's still a great song, though. This is deeper, but you want to dance to it and make love to it. That's the trick of it. On the year-end list, Billboard's Top 100 Songs of 2020, this came in at number 54. In Your Eyes, this one definitely had a distinctive 80s influence on it, all the way up to the uh, saxophone outro there by Thomas Jansen, wonderful in that one. He's, he's really talking about, there's a throw throwback to the fourth track, Scared to Live, uh, in, in the lyricism. In that one, there's some theories that, that Bell or whoever he's singing to had been unfaithful to him. I don't know the story there, who knows? Uh, and this one, he's definitely been unfaithful to her. Uh, and when it's said, the pre-course, when it's said, when it's done, yeah, I don't ever want to know. I can tell you what you, I can tell what you've done, yeah, when I look at you. So, I mean, is that a throwback that she's done something as well? And then the chorus, I see in your eyes, there's something burning inside you. I know it hurts to smile, but you try to. So he knows she's not happy, but he just tries to look at it positively and kind of ignores those things, which happens so many times in, in relationships. You know there's something wrong. The significant other knows there's something wrong, but you just smile and pretend like it's not there because it's too hard to address and too painful. So you just kind of keep flowing on, whether it's for days, weeks, months, or for a lot of people, years. So I really did like this one. Uh, just a different kind of take than the last few songs as far as instrumentally and sonically. Um, and you know, and he's, he's fantastic vocal performance yet again. Now we're gonna move on to Save Your Tears. It was a single, reached number four, reached the top five in 17 countries. And Billboard actually called this the best track on the album, which is, uh, which is heady praise because all these tracks have been quite good. Well, that was a nice one. I don't know if it's the best one on the record. That one's going to be a very tough choice, but save your tears. He's basically telling her, you know, he saw her dancing, so they've already broke up. When you saw me, I caught you by surprise. He said, you look so happy when I'm not with you, but when you saw me, I uh, caught you by surprise. A single teardrop falling from your eye. And then the refrain, I don't know why I run away. I'll make you cry when I run away. Verse two, basically saying you could ask me what was going on, but instead you walked by me like I wasn't there, pretending like you just didn't care. The chorus, take me back because I want to stay. Save your tears for another day. And then repeats that three times. In other words, don't cry more. Just take me back and you'll be happy. But then verse three, we get to it. So I made you think that I would always stay. I said some things that I should never say. Yeah, I broke your heart like someone did to mine. And now you won't love me for a second time. So... Some people are saying Selena broke his heart and he said we did that to Bella. Who the heck knows, right? But great lines, right? I've been hurt, so I'm going to hurt you. I don't know why I run away. Old girl said I made you cry. I make you cry when I run away. So he realizes in the, he says, I realize I'm much too late and you deserve someone better. Save your tears for another day. So he knows that uh, she won't take him back because he already messed her over too much. But uh, he still he still loves her and wants her. Really well put together song. Another song in Omar Broken Record, no pun intended, that's very 80s sounding in a very good way. Now we'll go to one of those rare songs I don't have any research on. Repeat After Me, Interlude. It's a sole interlude on this. Uh, it says it features him beckoning to his lover to repeat after him, essentially brainwashing them into loving him after the two have split up as she's with someone new. Now, it does feature Tame and Paul frontman Kevin Parker, a vocal introduction from him and his signature synth and psychedelia heavy production. Wow, that's going to be good. Love us and Tame and Paul here at the channel. Got a few rea song reactions to Tame and Paul up. Let's check this one out. Repeat after me in parentheses interlude just as i said the first it was 52 53 54 seconds somewhere in there before the weekend even came in you could hear kevin parker but you, i couldn't understand what he was saying just some fuzziness and stuff 
in there. And then it is just what it sounds like. Repeat after me. It's almost like hypnosis. You don't love him. You don't love him. Apparently this girl that he used to be with, she's now sleeping with another guy, but he thinks she's just doing it out of spite. She's thinking of him while she's with that guy is what The weekend keeps telling her. You don't love him. It doesn't mean anything if you're thinking of me. Um, you basically just, just come back to me. I promise you will always be mine. Oh, oh just repeat after me. So chorus, verse, chorus. Um, not a bad track, but actually my least favorite on here, but I've liked all the tracks up to this point. Like I said, not a bad track. Now we're going to move into the title track, which is also the longest track on here, a little over six minutes. Lyrics discuss the weekend's desire to have children, his wish to get back with an ex-girlfriend. Also references surprise on and off relationship with Bella. Throughout the first part of the song, he sings about missing his ex and his desire for them to reconcile. In the second half of the song, he proceeds to sing about the relationship's end being his fault. If his former lover were to return to him, he would not disappoint them. Again, come on, Abel, make those promises, brother. We have all done it, man. Let's check it out. After hours, longest track on here, The weekend said, after hours, the song is absolutely my thoughts at 4 a.m. alone after everything is done. I mentioned it during the reaction, highly produced, right? It, it really it reminds me of the first few tracks on the album as we go back to that high production. Uh, not in a bad way, some vocal treatment in here, and then there is on a lot of these songs, but on this one, it especially stands out. A lot of tempo changes. They do a fantastic job, and the song does not seem like six minutes at all, and it strips back at the very end. Um, just a lot of a lot of nice lyrics in here. Um, the bridge, I know it's all my fault. Made you put down your guard. I know I made you fall. Then said you were wrong for me. I lied to you, lied to you, lied to you. Can't hide the truth. I'd stay with her in spite of you. You did some things that you regret. Still ride for you because this house is not a home. And then the course without my baby, where are you now when I need you most? So remember he said this is 4 a.m. thoughts. He's all alone. I gave it all just to hold you close. Sorry that I broke your heart. And I said, baby, I'll treat you better than I did before. I'll hold you down and not let you go. This time, I won't break your heart. He's telling himself, he's trying to convince himself and convince her he is not going to let her down. Let's go to the final track, Until I Bleed Out. What a title, huh? The lyrics reference the on and off relationship he's had with Bella. He sings about the loss of his relationship and his former partner through the usage of metaphorical violence. They delve into how Abel's death is a result of his former lover leaving him. Wow, what a what a uh, intense way to finish out this fantastic album. Until I bleed out. So on this album, there's obviously three predominant themes, right? There's drug use, there's sex, and there's chasing relationships, broken relationships on and off again. Uh, my fault, your fault, want you back. No, I don't. And this kind of personifies all into this track. I can't move. I'm so paralyzed. I can't explain why I'm terrified. I'm so terrified. The pre-chorus, well, I don't want to touch the sky no more. So he doesn't want to get high anymore. I just want to feel the ground when I'm coming down. It's been way too long. I don't even want to get high no more. I just want it out of my life. I want to try to cut you out of my dreams so I'm bleeding out. So he doesn't want the drugs and he doesn't want the love anymore. But the very end, the outro, the way this whole album ends, I keep telling myself I don't need it. I don't need it anymore. I keep telling myself I don't need it anymore. Need it anymore. And it ends. So it's a cycle, right? This whole album goes through a cycle. Uh, that one was good. Good production. Good stuff on that one. Now we'll get to my favorite songs. It's tough, guys. This is 14 songs, 56 minutes. Some albums lend well to first-time reactions. Some albums are more challenging, not in a bad way. This one's challenging, right, because there's a lot to take in on first listen, and I only knew blinding lights off this. So uh, it's difficult to pick my favorite tracks because I, I basically liked almost every single track on here. I'm going to go, and I'm just throwing some stuff out. It might be totally different because I'm going to go back and spin this album quite a bit to really get into it and let it sink in. But I'm going to go Scared to Live. I mean, I'm going to be cliched here and go with Blinding Lights just because I know it. It's, it's a fantastic song. Uh, boy, this one this one's tough. Maybe I'll go with Save Your Tears, those three. But you could really talk me into about 10 of these. Now I'm going to get to my overall grade on this album. I'll give you some thoughts. Really didn't know anything about The weekend. Obviously saw his uh, Super Bowl performance. Saw his thoughts on the Grammys when he wasn't nominated for this album, which really seems crazy once you hear this thing back. Some things I really like on it. Obviously, the production value is top-notch, but I like the lyricism, right? The lyrics are direct and they're easy to understand, but not in too simplistic of a way. There's a lot of clever throwbacks to previous tracks on here. And then as I read previous songs on other albums, some of them almost a decade 
old. So very good writing, uh, very transparent. And, and I always enjoy that. There's honesty in these lyrics. His vocal performance is great. There's, there's great production. So there's treatment on some of the vocals, but he has a fantastic voice. Just very well put together. So all that said, on my first listen, I'm going to be a sky high 8.25 to maybe even an 8.5, just a fantastic offering. Thank you for bringing this to me, Alan. So I finally listened to The weekend. Really did enjoy it, guys. Let me know your thoughts below. What else I should check out? Your favorite tracks and, and anything else you want to share, good, bad, or indifferent, guys. Once again, thanks for joining me. And until next time, I will see you.